please join me in welcoming Noel Hanu. Is it okay if I sit? I mean, I can stand, but it seems a little strange because there's only a small group of us. And I'm wondering whether you guys want to come closer or should we, we're all good? Okay, Marge, you seem so far away. Um, so, aloha e na mamo o na haleho ike ike. So, uh, aloha to all of you beloveds who are um, part of um, the museums and the museum community here in Hawaii. Uh, I'm really excited to be here, so I want to thank Ihilani and Teresa for this kind invitation to be the first speaker for what is a new series. Uh, it's the Ihilani Palace's Na Mo'olelo Lecture Series. Um, and, you know, the benefit to being the inaugura inaugural speaker is there's no expectations, nobody knows uh, I don't have to follow in somebody else's, um, you know, uh, important footsteps. So it's it's actually um, quite relaxing and exciting to be um, to be the first one out of the box. And so in um, in honor of the Hawaiian tradition of mo'olelo, I kind of wanted to make this more of a talk story. So there are images, but I'm just gonna like um, let them run in the back, if that makes sense. And then there's one video that I wanted to show at the end. Um, and it seems a little weird, because most of you know, I mean, half of you are from Bishop Museum. I don't know why I'm talking about telling the story of or Bishop alumni, Museum. <laughs> or alumni. <laughs> and there's a board member, a Bishop Museum board member back there, so. Um, okay, but I'm going to start this. Play from start. Okay, so just know that this is going to be oddly personal, if that makes any sense. Okay, so Mo'olelo, um, uh, Mo'olelo is defined as a story, a tale, a myth, history, tradition, literature, legend, journal. Uh, so literally, it is mo'o and olelo, right? There's no distinction between a fictionalized or tall tale and a historical truth. What's important about mo'olelo is the, the nature of the process of passing on a story, the nature of the story moving from one individual to the next. In that sense, Mo'o is also a reference to the spine or to the um, vertebrae, that building block one upon the next. Um, mo'o is a word that's found actually, or moko, that's found pretty much all throughout Polynesia. And uh, it references a lizard. But in the Hawaiian context, it's also this ancient deity, very dragon-like they took both lizard and human form. So in the tale of Hi'iaka Ikapolio Pele, the goddess Hi'iaka retrieves the lover of her sister Pele. She has to travel all the way from Hawaii Island to Kauai and back with him. And on her way, she encounters over a dozen mo'o. Um, now, they stood as guardians and they challenged her passages along the way. Sometimes they appeared as women sunning themselves on the rocks only to skitter away. Other times they appeared larger than life, fierce foes ready to do battle. Mountains shook and the rivers ran red when Hi'iaka encountered the great male mo'o, Panaeva. <coughs> In Wailuku, Hi'iaka encountered two female mo'o named Pilia Mo'o and Kuawa. And as told by Ho'oulu'ma Hiehie and translated by Puakea Nogomeyer, these two Mo'o were champions of that place and there was no kupua that they feared or who made them worry that the law they had made restricting passage from one side of Wailuku River to the other would be opposed. For any supernatural or human who dared disregard the law they had set, death was the penalty. But what exactly did Mo'o protect? 
They guarded pathways and passages, waterways, river mouths, pools, and rainforests, places rich in resources, treasured, and vital. They were almost always women. And as ancients, as the first arrivers, they defended the land and resources from all who came after. But just as Mo'o repelled the unworthy, so too did they also grant access. Mo'o knew when to fight and when to yield, when to hold and when to step aside. The story that we have of Mo'o is the story often of the conqueror. It is the story of the prevailer, of Hi'iaka who went up and down the um, Pai Aina of Hawaii and besting Mo'o after Mo'o. What we do not know are the stories from the Mo'o's perspective. We did a storytelling recently, and I'll give a pitch. It's the third Thursday of every month at Mark's Garage. And our theme was Mo'o and Mo'olelo. And Imai Kalani shared a story from Calvin Ho, who does not view himself as a Hawaiian, but as a Hakipuan, somebody from Hakipu or an Oahuan. And their story of Mokoli'i or Mo'oli'i, which is the name for what we know, know to be Chinaman's hat, is not that Mo'oli'i or Mokoli'i was defeated and chopped up and strewn about the plains of Kualoa, but that he resides there still, sleeping beneath the ocean, his tail picking up as the island. So there are different stories of Mo'o, oftentimes really having to do with the different perspectives, right? So what does this have to do with us, with museums, and with me? So again, this is gonna be a little personal. <laughs> so at this point, I'm gonna come clean and I will note that I was born in the year of the dragon. So we're said to be powerful, kind-hearted, brave, but ultimately alone. Uh, I grew up the only child of a Japanese hippie with flaming red spirit and a relatively quiet Hawaiian Chinese father who um, for most of his life was an accountant. They divorced when I was young and um, I moved around a lot as the mother, as the child of a, a hippie. Uh, so we lived in a commune house in Manoa. We lived in apartments in Makiki, Wailai, Kapuhulu, and uh, Waimanalo, Aiea, Kaimuki. Uh, it was the 70s, and we uh, went to the Diamond Head Crater Festivals, uh, Koho'olawe protests, and uh, we hung out with Puhi Pao when he was known as Abe Ahmad. Uh, my mother and stepfather Jim moved to Waianae in the 1980s, the early 80s, uh, and thus began in earnest my mother's love affair with all things Hawaiian. We hung out with Puanani Burgess, Ho'oipo de Cambra, Kamakavan Olahafen, and her magical three-legged dog, Kizzy. Uh, but, so I was not raised to find culture within the four walls of a building. And, you know, even though, so I had no real connection to Bishop Museum other than the obligatory fourth grade visit. Um, when you can look at the whale and, and roam around but not touch anything. Um, and so I never really had any particular affinity for museums um, in general or Bishop Museum in, in specifically. Um, middle and high school, I went to a small pink stucco Italian manor on the slopes of Diamond Head that will remain nameless. Um, <laughs> But I'll tell you that it, it, it taught me to be a little bit like a brindled mo'o. So I learned how to change and I went to school with really, really wealthy people by day and hung out with the Crane Park gang who like sniffed paint and stole bicycles at night. 
uh, and there was this process of kind of daily morphing. Um, uh, so I became slightly more culturally and politically engaged um, I, when I went to UH uh, Manoa. I did, graduated with a degree in political science, went on to uh, the William S. Richardson School of Law, and um, eventually that took me to Washington, D.C., first as an intern and then as counsel to the Senate Select Committee on Indian Affairs. So from 1992 to 1997, I worked on a number of issues affecting Alaska Natives, Native Hawaiians, um, American Indians. Many of those issues were uh, on grave protections, repatriation, historic preservation, housing, uh, education, religious freedom. Uh, so we held a lot of hearings um, um, several of them were on the establishment of the what would become the National Museum of the American Indian. Um, it was also a lot, as I said, hearings on the Native American Grave Protection and Repatriation Act. It had already passed, but um, when I was there, we were considering amendments. So it was a litany of groups. Uh, individuals, tribes, Hawaiian organizations, museums, agencies coming up expressing why they were unhappy with the law and what needed to change. Um, as a Hawaiian lost in the sea of Washington DC you tend to cling to other like-minded individuals and we, cr we would create our own cultural pilgrimages one of which was to caravan down to Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts to see uh, what was um, one of the last remaining Ku images in the world. Um, so I was learning about the spiritual significance of our Hawaiian collections abroad, even as I went to museums, national museums, some of the best museums in the United States and saw nothing or very little of our own people, our own Hawaiian and Pacific cultural story. Uh, there, was, um, there was a very old exhibition that featured many dioramas. So um, uh, full, full sized models of Hawaiians behind glass doing, uh, engaged in various cultural activities. And that was in the Museum of Natural History. Um, and um, that has since come down with no plan uh, in the immediate or near future or very distant future of having a new uh, Pacific exhibition or hall open up. They're, they're doing a temporary one, but not a permanent. Um, so when I returned to Hawaii in 1997, um, it was with a renewed appreciation of the importance of not just museums, but um, specifically uh, involving the repatriation and reburial of ancestral Hawaiian remains or iwi kupuna. Uh, so I became a member of Hui Malama Ina Kupuna Ohava'ine, um, participated in a number of reburials and and repatriation, some of which were with Bishop Museum. Um, this led to a National Park Service grant, which, which was written specifically to allow, na allow Bishop Museum to work in, co in cooperation with Hui Malama in the identification of unassociated funerary um, objects. Uh, that in turn led to a permanent position in cultural collections as part of what was um, actually a quite innovative educational program to allow cross-cultural uh, engagement with Bishop Museum and Peabody Essex Museum and the Alaska Native Heritage Center. And that's because Senator Inouye, Senator Stevens and, um, and Senator Kennedy were uh, very good friends and they decided that it would be a good thing to create um, to create an, uh, a program that would allow our, these, the institutions in those three states to get together. So uh, we got to do a lot of in innovative um, things. So, um, but that being said, 
the, the museum that I encountered, which was, uh, again, so like 1998, right, 1999, um, it, it, it was kind of old and tired. Um, it was frankly disliked by um, quite a few people, particularly in the Hawaiian community. And I, you know, I think when you're an old institution over a hundred and um, hundred plus years by then, there's a lot of things that, you know, that a lot of mistakes that had been made or a lot of things that were appropriate for the time, but had subsequently not been um, ex uh, uh, considered acceptable. And so, um, and, and, and there were also, um, people who had generational grudges. So their, ma their mother or their grandmother in one, in one particular incident ha had gone to ask to see something in the archives and had been turned away. Archival material that was actually in their own family or had been donated by their own family. And so these, there, were a, there was sort of a lot of uh, resentment that had built up over a long period of time. And um, so that was the m museum that I um, had encountered. Um, also, I, I think when, we, when we're thinking about the, the crowning jewel of Bishop Museum, which was Hawaiian Hall, you know, that had opened to the public in 1903. Um, it, it had been really considered the jewel of the campus, um, but had remained remarkably unchanged, in, as you can see in some of these images, for almost the entire century. Um, and so um, when, I, when, when, when I was there, um, still the third floor depicted the immigrant collection. Uh, I don't know if you, how many of you remember that, but uh, it, w it did not tell the story of the immigrant experience. It actually told the story of, of um, the home country that say Korean uh, immigrants had come from and it, and it was filled with um, cases of things that had been bought in Korea, not necessarily reflective of the um, historical uh, um, experience of, of Koreans in Hawaii. Um, so uh, a lot of, uh, you know, and then the second, first and second floor was sort of this disjointed narrative. It was pieces of prior exhibitions that had been there. And the introductory case literally started with the death of Captain Cook. So the, the notion that that narrative, of the, the introductory narrative begins at contact. Um, so m most Hawaiians had really kind of come to view Hawaiian Hall and, and uh, sort of Bishop Museum on a, on a um, broader scale as, as in many ways outdated and irrelevant. That's not to say that there weren't things like the press and other things that the, the Bishop Museum that was doing that was incredibly, incredibly important and, and especially in terms of scholarship and research, but that the reality that I encountered, right, was the reality that Hawaiians did not think, did not look too kindly upon Bishop Museum. Um, so, um, Again, when I got there, we, we had this sort of innovative pro project and we started, one of the things we started to do was a native um, storytelling, an annual storytelling festival. And it allowed us to go to other places and see how Alaska Natives and other tribal groups were telling their stories. And, and um, you know, uh, getting excited and inspired by that, in 2000, we put together a little advisory group to dream about the renovation of Hawaiian Hall. This was without money, without a plan, without any um, promise of, the, the, of this group of people that this is going to be implemented. But we gathered together a diverse group of Native Hawaiians um, involving um, Kumu Lake, uh, John Lake was one of them, Dwight Kawahikawa, who was a architect. We had artists, we had scholars, we had uh, Kalepa Babayan was there. So a kind of eclectic, very interesting group of Hawaiians. And it was not always easy having these conversations. And, and one person that was, was a part of the group was an, actually a very well-known critic of Bishop Museum. But in my opinion, um, 
being the subject of criticism is actually um, a good thing because it means that, they're, that they care enough to be critical. If they didn't care, they wouldn't even talk to you. They wouldn't even, they, they would basically ignore you totally. So the fact that they're willing to be critical is actually a positive thing and it's an invitation to dialogue about that thing which, which, is, which is upsetting them. So it was a, that was a hard lesson to learn because of the, the information was very, um, angry and painful, but at the same time, I think that was part of the process of consultation. You cannot go into a consultation and expect that it's a love fest and everybody's gonna uh, hug each other and then leave feeling good about it. I mean, that's not you know, what consultation is. So um, we created this document, this sort of dream document, and, and then put it aside, along with the other Hawaiian Hall plan, which stemmed from the 1980s. So now we have two plans that are kind of sitting aside. And lo and behold, um, five years later, uh, our then director, Bill Brown, decided that it was time to renovate the hall. I find this really interesting because he doesn't have, he's not a well-regarded director um, in some respects now, but he actually kick-started something that ends up um, going into the time that Tim Johns is director. So I think that Tim, uh, that, that the director that is there when it opens is the one that sort of receives the, the, the recognition and accolades when actually the harder thing was the one who started it when we had no money. I mean, I, anyway, um, I find that uh, really interesting. Uh, so it's this idea of like a seed being planted, right? And sometimes the seed grows. And so we have this renovation. And, the, and the, the renovation, again, half of you guys are Bishop Museum. I, mean, I don't know why I'm saying this. But anyway, OK, there's, so there's five members uh, on, of the team that are internal to Bishop Museum. Then we had a historic architect, Glenn Mason. Uh, we had a construction manager, Frey Heath. And then we had um, Ralph Applebaum and Associates, uh, which is um, which was the exhibit design firm for both Hawaiian Hall and eventually Pacific Hall. So combined, we're talking about an eight-year, 24 million renovation project. Um, you know, uh, someone was asking me uh, about the, 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 the layers. So we talk about the fact that there's three different floors with different narratives on each floor. The bottom floor is Kayakea, the wide expanse of the sea. The second floor is Val Kanaka, the realm of man. And the third floor is Val Lani, um, um, the heavenly realm, and where we tell the stories of our chiefs. But um, the, tr the truth of the matter is that we actually had had, you know, this, this, this collaborative, cross-cultural collaborative um, project, one of the outcomes was creating a website called Hawaii Alive. And, we, and our job was to come up with 40 treasures of Bishop Museum. And then we were going to tell the story of each of these treasures. And so we were at this meeting with, and it was, we're at WGBH in Boston, of all places, a little weird. And um, one of the people on the team kept pressing us, well, what is the cultural motif. What, it, what is this like signature thing that's going to be used as a design motif in the website? And what it, it, don't you have some organizational structure that really reveals a, 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 a Hawaiian way of thinking about the organization of these 40, right? And they were showing us little circles. And I'm like, finally, I said, you know, actually, it's really, it's, it's the triangle. It's the niho, it's the shape for Hawaiians. But another way of looking at it is as an island. And an island has layers, this idea of realm. Uh, Kumu Lake would often talk about that multitude of realm, realms that exist. And, and so we uh, went with this idea of vau lani, vau akua. I'm sorry. Actually, initially, it was vau akua. Now it's vau lani. But Auntie Pat Bacon said, you don't use the term Va'okua because people wander around in that realm and never return because it's the realm of the gods. So we ended up going with, with Va'olani, uh, Va'okanaka, um, and 
Kayakea. And so that is the structure that was on our website before Hawaiian Hall began. And when we started to get into the, how we would think about Hawaiian Hall, it became natural to think three floors of Hawaiian Hall, three flares in the website, and that is that sort of the approach that um, we ended up taking. And um, you know, I'm, I, uh, um, we worked a lot with Hawaiian consultants. When you work with consultants, um, you have to work with the right ones, right? So you can't talk to somebody on feather work about fish hooks, right? And you can't talk to somebody who's really interested in the monarchy period about, um, uh, um, you know, about um, the coup images and about Hawaiian deity. So uh, I think part of the, the process of Hawaiian Hall was really reaching out into the community to find, find, to find those people, not, not the designated two or handful that are, that's gonna consult on the whole thing because there was so much information that, that needed to be, uh, that we needed guidance on. And I think a lot of times that as museum, uh, museum people, we tend to think that we're supposed to know all the answers. And one of the most liberating things for me to find was to be able to acknowledge when you don't know what you don't know. And to not pretend like you know. And to be able to, um, to have the to understand that the, that the obstacle, it, like the, the issue was my own issue. The fear of getting on a phone and cold calling someone and saying, hi, <laughs> my name is Noelle, you don't know me, I work at Bishop Museum, um, but I really wanna, I'm really wondering whether you'd be willing to come down and talk to us about X, right? That, that was my own fear, that I was afraid to do that. And some of the, some of the closest relationships I ever formed was the direct result of some random call um, and someone responding. Because no matter how much people say they um, were frustrated, angry, upset at Bishop Museum, all they were actually looking to do was find a reason to love the museum again and to be um, invited back into that space. Um, so a lot of things. Um, happened that I think were, were um, what's the term, sort of um, like meant to be. So the, the plan that we did with the, Hawaii, with the Hawaiian group, I would say 80 to 90% of what we came up with was ultimately implemented. Uh, we worked on a mural with Meliana Meyer that was completed in 2005. And then here at the end, we've got this big empty space on the third floor. And how are you going to end a story when you've just gone through um, uh, uh, contact, um, population loss, overthrow, annexation, assimilation, militarization? Like, where are you going to go from that point? And it was really important that we try and find a way to uplift that end. So this idea that through difficulty and hardship are we transformed and made a more um, united uh, community, right? That all of us have, agree, uh, have experienced heartache and loss, but we're still standing and we're here, right? So it was really important to kind of end on a message that, that was inclusive, because if, all at the, if, the, if at the end of the day, all we did was teach people something about Hawaiian culture, that's not enough. Like it has to be that, that, you're, that, that it, bec it becomes an avenue into uh, 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 um, something where they're able to learn about and reflect on something in their own life and, and, and um, find resonance. So we opened in 2009, um, August, so nine years. Um, and it was really celebratory. There were just thousands of people that came out. Um, the evaluations, I just wanna, we have a comment book if you've ever been up there. So 
And this is kind of around the time of the opening. Very symbolic and touching, so proud to be Hawaiian. Um, May all the gods be pleased with this place. That was someone from Texas. A true revelation, Venezuela. Everyone indigenous could be in this museum. Your story is my story is our story. And that was someone from um, Yurok Pit Pit River. Um, Most importantly, for me, uh, Imai Kalani Kalahele, who is one of the artists featured in the museum, he brought his grandkids in uh, and he said, Ho, oh, for the first time, Hawaiian Hall feels Hawaiian. And it took us a century, uh, but we finally got there. Uh, one of the things that would happen is Vel- Velsoni Hedonico, uh, there he is would bring his Pacific Island study students and they would go through Pacific Hall, Polynesian Hall then, and they would write a report about what they saw. And um, when he brought them, Hawaiian Hall had opened. So they got to see this really beautiful Hawaiian Hall. And then they got to see this sort of antiquated, sad, static Pacific Hall with lime green carpeting. Um, and. And so um, obviously it became really evident that that process of renovation couldn't stop with Hawaiian Hall, but had to continue. Um, And um, so the the team was the same with others. Um, We had uh, an expanded storyline involving um, the sort of the scientific uh, excavations and the work that had gone on in Bishop Museum um, in the Pacific. And so the team of five was really expanded to include um, Dr. Tian Long and others who were working in, um, in, ar- in archives, uh, not, uh, sorry, not archives, in archaeology. Um, and then other people kind of carried that through because there were a lot of shifts going on. So Dr. Mara Mulroney back there uh, is one of them. And, and then actually, uh, Elise, Dr. Elise was here when she, she was an intern and she took one of the pictures actually for Pacific Hall. Um, uh, anyway, so it, uh, the one thing I will say about Pacific Hall is it was, it's smaller. There's only two floors but it was much harder. There, there are way more communities. I mean, you know, the, 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 if, if you think of it as a continent, it's by far the largest continent in the entire world. Um, the number of languages, the number of cultural diversity, and, and probably worst of all, is really that it was a community that the museum really had very little connection to in a way that like, uh, it's not true for Bishop Museum. You readily knew who to contact. That was not the case for Pacific Hall. And I think one of the, one of the defaults then is you kind of go to this, ac- well, where are they? They're in academia. They're uh, students in, in, at UH. And, and so I, and, you know, so I, I, I will readily admit that it's one of the things in retrospect that I wish that we had done more um, consulting with different groups. That being said, um, the Pacific Hall that opened up, and it took a lot of renovation because they had boarded up. If you see some of the photos, they had really almost, they had taken bleach to koa railings and koa posts and had turned beautiful red living koa, this horrible white gray. Uh, All of that was restored. Thankfully, they were able to peel back the boarded up railings and they found the vast majority of the railings still there. So um, uh, Pacific Hall was, was uh, opened in, in 2013. Um, uh, it, it was, the day was magical. There were 6,000 people. Um, there was Maori songs reverberating within the hall. We had students um, with their mural displayed for the first time. We had families learning about voyaging, the stars, people laughed. There were people drinking ava underneath the holla tree. Like, when does that ever happen? 
Um, and But, you know, not everything was smooth. And one of the biggest criticisms uh, actually was, um, was the map because the map did not depict the Republic of Vanuatu, but, it, but by its colonized name of New Hebrides. And so our keynote speaker was like, he just wanted to cover up the entire thing with a mat, like right before the opening. You know, so I mean, so there, there were definite um, uh, challenges along the way, but I think that, and, 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 and things still had to be updated and changed um, but by and large, it's been a, a well-received hall. Um, six months later, I, I ended up leaving Bishop Museum after the opening of Pacific Hall. So it was a place I had called home for 15 years. Uh, I learned a lot. Again, it's okay to admit that what you don't know, it's quite liberating. Um, I learned that consultation doesn't just mean listening, uh, it means shared decision making. Uh, it means investing in community and in relationships. And sometimes that means a willingness to relinquish authority. Uh, I learned not to fear criticism. I learned to trust in a kind of kako approach and the importance of supporting and uplifting one another. And I learned that people are really looking for reasons to love museums and to love Bishop Museum again. Um, so when I left, a fellow colleague uh, called me a mo'o. Um, and he talked about guarding and guiding and prodding and prompting and, um, and um, that that was a lonely path. And my response was, you know, that sometimes mo'o move in processions as far as the eye can see. Mo'o inanea um, ends up in Vaulani, which is ironically where I live, sort of. Um, and and that, that procession of mo'o cross through the entire island. Um, but the point again is, so what are, if we're the modern mo'o, like what are we guarding? What are we protecting? And mo'o do not protect things, right? They protect places and spaces. They protect passageways and portals. And uh, there's something called a lua mo'o which is, um, it's a pit guarded by mo'o, but sometimes you can descend into that pit and you emerge someplace else entirely. There's stories that you can enter a lua mo'o on one side of the island and you end up entirely on the other side. So it really is this idea of a, a portal or a passageway. So if mo'o are guarding museum spaces and those things which exist within museums. Can we think of these oceanic treasures that are contained within these institutions? Um, are they more than just tangible artifacts residing at home and beyond? So they were created by our ancestors centuries ago uh, who invested in them their mana and embodied within these things that they created their worldview, right? So, th so understanding kappa, understanding how something was carved is a way of understanding that world, that mindset of this ancestor. So when so much has been changed and altered, um, these treasures become really critical access points that link us back into a time that is largely lost. Um, and in some instances, this, they're the only ones left. Like if we're trying to get somewhere to someone, that may be the only passageway. So in 200 and, sorry, 2010, uh, Bishop Museum loaned two temple images. Um, of the god Ku. 
and uh, it was for this exhibition, a Ku Anakapaya Unification Responsibility and the Ku Images. And um, one of them was the Ku image that I had seen in Peabody Essex Museum, and the other I had never seen, and in fact many hadn't seen because it had been put away for some time, which was the Ku image at the British Museum. And um, they left Hawaii probably in the 1830s and 40s. Nobody, some of the details are fairly sketchy in terms of when they actually left. Uh, they represented the male principle, chiefly governance and politics. And um, they came together because we had originally wanted to do it for Hawaiian Hall opening in 2009, and it just got, um, we had enough on our plate, much less trying to manage this major gathering. And so it ended up moving to 2010. And 2010 was because of the Ahakane conference. So five, some 500 men were gathering to consider issues of responsibility of kuleana, of what it means to be a male in today's, a Hawaiian male in today's society. And then it was the 200th anniversary of the unification of the Hawaiian kingdom. And uh, given their association with politics and governance, it, it became clear that there was an alignment happening that made their wanting to come together um, really critical. And um, I, I'm not gonna get into uh, the, the details too much. What I will say is that um, it, was, it was never a sure thing, except it was absolutely a sure thing. It was never, um, you plan as if there would, all three would come together, because we had one, right? Two were coming in, and yet only one institution had said yes. O funding was only for one. I mean, but the thing is that I think it was a testament to the community, the, the uh, largely Hawaiian male community that was uh, invited to, uh, to um, be advisors to this process that, that really um, uh, gave us the fortitude to move forward even when there were no guarantees, if that makes any sense. Um, and uh, uh, I'll just, you know, in, in one institution said, no, maybe we'll do it a year later. Well, maybe 2011 is better for us. And it was like, uh, no, we have to move forward. And if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. So there's a certain amount of faith and trust that you have to have in the process. Um, it was also my, my first real experience with, I, with, with, with what I would consider to be seeding or, you, or, or um, granting authority. So the, this, this group made decisions about, uh, according to the moon phase, when the images should be shipped out and depart from, um, from England, when they should um, arrive, when they should be unpacked, when they should be brought to the museum and, sort of, and, 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 and when the exhibit should open to the public. Um, how tall the, the images should be on the on the platform, on the, um, uh, was, uh, that was all decision making that these Kane did. But those decisions didn't come without their own kuleana, that they, that, that they agreed to take on the responsibility if there was any blowback, if there were any consequences, if they were woken up and, and, um, uh, and were, were unhappy with what they saw, right? <coughs> So, um, but at the end of it, for four months, some 70,000 people came. And um, there were Hawaiians that had never been to Bishop Museum that came. There were Hawaiians that flew from, from off island just to come. And um, there were there are three Hawaiians that are carvers, and they actually have very different perspectives. They don't even really get along all the time. And at the opening, they were sitting on, they were sitting in front of the three ku, all three of them, and 
pointing and talking. And I was like, that, that's what unification looks like. They were unified, the three coup, but so was everybody else that came. And um, so I, uh, one of the things that we did, that one of the last things, and we just added, we had these public programs that were going on that were focused on different aspects of coup. And um, I gotta tell you, one of the things that, that happened is that as a, trying to organize something as a Hawaiian woman, and, and it's a largely male endeavor, like, you know, oh, thank you. Uh, it's, not, it's not the easiest of things, but I think, again, it has to do with really appreciating the opportunity to facilitate something and allow something to happen that was meant to happen. And, and to understand that um, there's times to just like step back, even if um, that was not the, uh, uh, that was not perhaps would have been maybe acceptable museum, I don't know, protocol, right? Um, so one of the things we did is we added a, we added a program. Because a lot of people were upset. They didn't want to see them leave. Why are they going? They were stolen in the first place. Um, well, why can't we just keep them? You know, what happens if we keep them? One guy was like all set to bring his, he worked for them, he, he was associated with the military, this Hawaiian guy, and he was like, I'm going to bring a, uh, uh, what was it, helicopter down and I'm going to kidnap them and we're going to hide them and keep them here. <laughs> and, um, and so we had, we, we, we had an a evening program where we just invited people to express their, um, their eha at seeing them leave. And then we had um, Bishop Museum management there, or, or you know, people fairly high up in the chain of command, they're listening. Um, and then there was, uh, you know those, a star advertiser, or you know, the newspaper. There's a Hawaiian language. The um, they they do. They're like. Um, do they still do it? The editorial. You know what I mean? Like the the, the yeah, like the um, news of Hawaii, but it's in Hawaiian. And in Hawaiian, they they were like, we should all be protesting. These images should stay. And I was like, oh, I was so excited to be to just have um, have the community be that engaged that in Hawaiian language, there would be published in the paper a, a, a call out to keep them in Hawaii. Anyway, um, all right, so clearly they ended up going back. Um, and uh, uh, I still feel a, a profound sense of loss every time I look at them because I, I see ours, our ku image, and I, I, I know that the other two belong at his side. So there's this sort of profound sense of loss. And, um, you know, but to go from adulation to disappearing, right? From this light into the darkness. And, and, and that is the same feeling as you go through a lot of these, these, these um, preeminent museums in Europe and elsewhere. That while we as Hawaiians, as Pacific Islanders, are part of their collections, we're not part of what is visible to people. We are not on exhibit. We're not, um, we are, you know, it's the, the presence of the absence, right? That silence that's there. And, um, but, I, um, how do I say this? So that being said, right? There are European curators of Oceania, and they're there because they love the Pacific, because they, they understand its relevance to the world now more than ever, right? And that we're profoundly connected. Um, but there is this, this reality of museums, right? And it's this Western colonial construct and it's allowing for only a very narrow interpretation. So even though um, our collections, our treasures, um, you know, our very remains are part of this, this world history, we're all but invisible. And so the question is, are there, are there alternate models and constructs? We are not ever going to be 
the preeminent exhibition at the British Museum. We are not ever going to be the, the famous mummy, the famous Elgin marbles that arguably do not belong there, but belong um, in Greece where they came from. So, and, and is that where we belong to begin with, right? So is there another way that we can think about these collections that live afar, right? Um, and so is it these permanent or temporary exhibitions of oceanic art in Europe and beyond? Or is it protracted, proactive and engaged dialogue about loans to their home communities? Um, and these exhibitions of which Ku was absolutely one of them, they have the capacity to transform, to engage, to uplift, to animate, to unite in ways that are really expan expansive and profound. So for me, I, I think the way of looking at it is we're all more. Everyone here who works at a museum, we're all mo'o, but there are also mo'o dwelling in faraway places, right? And at their core, mo'o are defending not what, not a thing necessarily, but where. So they're defending a sense of place, a passageway, a portal through which people can access another time reach another layer of understanding about their own people and themselves. Mo'o share love, a desire to protect and preserve a way of life, of living, of ancient knowledge and ways of being. By protecting collections, Mo'o protect Ike. They protect insight and knowledge and the ability to pass on this, gen this information from one generation to the next through succession. Mo'o in the end protect so that access may be granted to those who are worthy, who are in need. So we are here in this room as Mo'o but we know that mo'o exist in far away places. And we have to recognize that while we, not, while we may not always agree that their love for Oceania is, is genuine, that's, they hear the kahea. Why else would these individuals be drawn to protect and care for collections that have not been home in centuries? How can we work with them to facilitate the return of these treasures to those who need them the most and join in a collective understanding that the journey of these treasures need not be over? So let us consider perhaps for a moment that our chiefs often gifted that which they treasured the most, not because it solidified relationships and honored rank, but because they knew their mana would travel, traverse oceans of time and space and create portals between the here and the now and the then. And perhaps the best example of this is the recent return of Kalanio Pu'u and his uh, Mahiole and Ahu'ula. Working together, Pacific institutions made that happen. Working together, people in Oceania, Europe, and beyond can be the anui nui. We can be the bridge. We can be the two mo'o that started us on our journey. We can be pilia mo'o and kuawa, and we can reach across the divide and make those connections and allow for our treasures to return, we can be the link, not the divide. We can be a passageway. We can reach out toward one another and allow for access 
for entrance, for engagement, and for enlightenment. So, in the words of Keloha Kelakolio, we can kua mo'o, stand together as mo'o. So, Imai Kalani, a long time ago, he was my mother's best friend, uh, wrote a poem for my mother on, her, on the occasion of her birthday. Uh, it says, we crossed over their backs, up from the beginning, moving with us in our journey here, mo'os in the pools, loving under the moon, destroying armies with their tails, shaking the ground when they walk. Some are small, short, and shy. Others are long and slim. They are gray and brown, pink and green. Mo'os over here, mo'os over there. Mo'os are everywhere. So, sorry, all right, this is the last section. Um, so it's now been four years since I left the museum. And um, I, you know, I think when you're in the museum, you don't have time to reflect on it because you're just doing the work. You know what I mean? I mean, there's something to do every day and you don't get to sit there and think about it. And because for a lot of people, they went from say, um, graduate school, PhD, or museum studies, or art history, and they end up at the museum. Well, that's clearly was not my pathway. So I didn't even know that there were names for what we did. Like, I didn't know, I'm like, oh, that's why they, that's what they call it? Like, oh, there's a word for it, De decolonizing practices. Like, I honestly, you just did it. And then, and then um, later on put words to the process. And um, so I now can reflect on it, you know, and really see that we were engaged in some deeply decolonial processes. And, you know, that's everything from, from issues of repatriation um, all the way to this notion of not just consultation, but, and, and not just inviting somebody through the door, but sometimes it means turning over the key. Right, um, and I, um, so in thinking about this, a, a lot of times the, the, the word um, that people often use is seeding authority. So it used to be consultation, you listen, you don't have, you, or pretend to listen, right? And then now you're really listening, and now you're sharing decision making, and now it's about seating authority. But seating authority has all these really incredi incredible negative connotations. Um, you're, you're giving up something that you don't, that you don't want to. You're, you're, something's being taken away from you. Um, but I, I, would think, I think that it should really be not C-E-D-E, -E, but really, S E E D. Like, can we think of it as seeding authority? That what we're doing is we're planting seeds for relationships to be built. And that the relinquishing of something can actually result in something being created that's even bigger, that is more important. That the relation, in other words, the relationship between Bishop Museum and Te Papa and between Hawaiians and Maori was more important than the physical location of Kalanio Pu'u's cloak and Mahiole in Wellington. And um, so, you know, I want to I, I want to leave with that, leave with this thought, right? Which is this notion of seeding authority, because by all traditional best practices in a museum realm. I, multiple eyewitness accounts say that that cloak at Mahiole was freely given by Kalani Opu'u to Captain Cook. That's like the holy grail of museum provenance. Um, and I think a lot of, t a lot of museum um, research and time has been spent really trying to sort of secure collections and, and, and um, in, the museum, in museums. And so this idea that the pinnacle has been reached, you can't get much more freely gifting than that, and yet he still came home. And he came home because there was a reason, because 
Hawaiians are considering issues of sovereignty, of self-determination, any number of, of, of spiritual, political, cultural reasons that Kalani Opu'u found his way home um, well over a century and a half since his departure. So um, I just want to end by saying that I think the language has changed. Um, uh, we used to go into consultation meetings um, uh, with a lot of anger and hostility. Uh, and now it's carrying boxes of chocolates and <laughs> feather lay. Um, and I, I think it's by, it's with the understanding of kind of our shared humanity. And understanding that um, these individuals with whom we're engaged with have a genuine um, love for that which they are um, presiding over. Um, there's also generational changes that, the, that people who had occupied those spaces that had previously kept the doors closed are really aging out of the system and there's a new generation coming in. Um, but I think it's also about as Hawaiians, as um, museum professionals, really finding new ways to work across a divide um, that is based on our shared humanity. Um, with the understanding that hopefully not, um, mo'o do not always have to defend, right? Mo'o can equally be about access, about allowing people in, about knowing when to stand and knowing when to step aside. Thank you.